Hi there. I'm Jim Zirin. Welcome back to more Conversations in the Digital Age. The digital revolution is perhaps the most transformative in the history of the world, a triumph of innovation and technological mastery. But it has also exposed us to great danger, government surveillance of browsing behavior, Snowden-style revelations of NSA infiltration into the Middle East banking system, hacked emails, identity theft, cyber fraud, invasions of privacy, and peddling of our browser searches to predatory marketers, all issues dominating the news these days. With us is Adam Levin. Adam Levin is an expert in online misbehavior, hacking, and cybercrime. He is chairman and founder of CyberScout, consultants on online security, and author of the best-selling book, Swiped, How to Protect Yourself in a World Full of Scammers, Fishers, and Identity Thieves. Adam, it is my pleasure to welcome you back to the program. Jim, thanks for having me. And after listening to your description of the digital age, I think I'm going to go home and hide under my mattress. Well, that's the way it makes <laughs> me feel as well. Let's start with our election. Sure. Everyone's mind is on our election. Uh, was it hacked? Was it hacked by whom? And did it influence the outcome? Well, it certainly seems from everything I've seen and read in reports that I've heard about that the Russians are up to their little eyeballs in this. And uh, I think in certain ways it did, in fact, impact the election. I think the continual flow of negative news about Hillary Clinton, the Democratic Party, wasn't very helpful, that's for sure. Uh, but I also think that uh, this, unfortunately, is a long time coming in terms of interference with our elections, in terms of the vulnerabilities that we face as a society. And I think we really have to get more serious about it. And I know the states are starting to get more serious about it. Homeland Security has finally designated the election system as a, as a part of critical infrastructure. I guess it's the 17th component. But what's most disturbing about what happened in the election is the fact that until the Democratic National Committee and John Podesta was hacked, cybersecurity wasn't a front burner issue. We were hearing more about building the Great Wall of Mexico than we were about cybersecurity. And I think that's a very dangerous situation because what can happen when you have a cyber incident, a cyber geddon, when you bring down the power grid or the financial grid or a variety of other grids that we have in this country, um, you could wreak re real death and destruction and, and at a nuclear level. That's what's so scary about it. Well, and you can also transform uh, the course of uh, policy. For example, um, the Brexit referendum in England is now, according to a parliamentary committee, uh, was the subject of uh, possible hacking. Uh, there was an outage at a registration site. Uh, the Russians uh, have been uh, suspected of having a hand in it because they wanted to weaken the uh, European Union. I mean, what do you make of that? Well, you know, again, everybody's going to blame the Russians for everything, and I have no doubt that they have a lot to do with most everything. Uh, but the Chinese are pretty active, as are the North Koreans, are the, as the, Iran the Iranians. Um, as well as ISIS now is even involved in, uh, in hacking endeavors. Um, so, you know, this is a world we have to understand that it doesn't even require a state-sponsored hacker anymore. The president was right. You could have a, well, I've never seen a 400-pound hacker, but you could have a hacker operating out of a bed in his mother's basement. In New Jersey. And, uh, in New Jersey. But you could have that going on. It's not impossible. But with everything we've seen, certainly with our election and a number of the other hacks and breaches we've seen, there is a certain earmark, there is a certain code that's used by certain state-sponsored hackers that hack for Russia that, that appears. And that's disturbing. But of course, there is the doctrine of the false flag. Uh, Ann Coulter and Sean Hannity uh, claim that uh, the hacking of... Uh, of our presidential election may not have been done by Russia at all, but may have been done by somebody else. Well, the echo chamber is, you know, operating at full speed, and certainly uh, anything Ann Coulter and Sean mm -hmm. Hannery say, as far as I'm concerned, is suspect. So, but that's my viewpoint. One of the uh, the earmarks of cyber warfare, uh, unlike uh, conventional warfare, is uh, it's very difficult to pin anything on uh, the person who might have done it. And you can't, it's hard to retaliate without knowing that uh, somebody out there uh, did you dirt. 
You're not wrong about that, but the truth is there are certain markings that you can see in codes and in malware uh, that relate to certain hacking groups. It's their trademark. And uh, certainly the ones we've seen that relate to the election uh, relate to Russia. Now, we've seen you know, breaches all around this country that, uh, that clearly are viewed as relating back to China. The breach of the three uh, health care insurers, the big one that occurred in 2015, Anthem Premier Excellus, uh, had all the markings of the Chinese. The breach of the Office of Personnel Management, uh, where you had 21.5 million Social Security numbers, uh, 5.6 million sets of fingerprints, and the most intimate details of 19.5 million uh, background investigations that related to security checks uh, seem to wend its way back to China. So, uh, you know, they've certainly been been active, uh, perhaps even more active. Well, and the Sony breach uh, related to North Korea. That is correct, and now they've just uncovered uh, the fact that they think it also relates to the breach of the Bank of Bangladesh, where some $81 million was, uh, was stolen. Uh, and that was a North Korean operation. North Korean years. operation, as far as I can tell. It was, or, well, or North Koreans working with others, uh, or others who sure look like it was North Korea. Well, also alarming is uh, the uh, apparent effort to undermine our uh, intelligence. Uh, CIA, NSA, uh, we have the Vault 7 leak, which was done by Wikipedia. Uh, well, no, no, we, we, the WikiLeaks. That well, was, WikiLeaks, that, we, that was released Wiki, WikiLeaks. by WikiLeaks, yeah. but that it was, you know, it appears that the breach was, was probably done by somebody working for the Russians. Yes. Now, uh, Mike uh, Pompeo says WikiLeaks is a hostile intelligence organization. Well, I certainly think WikiLeaks has a big mouth. Yes. I mean, basically, you know, their goal is to expose whatever they think is appropriate to expose and there have been some questions raised as to whether they've been completely truthful on where they're getting their information. Uh, so it's, it's, a, it's disturbing. Now at least the one silver lining in some of the stuff that came out about Vault 7 is it appears that encryption may be working, that the CIA hacking tools related to how does one hack an individual device, uh, whether it's putting USB on a television, a smart television, or hacking into individual telephonic devices. Uh, but that also raises the other question of, we are surrounded by billions, and we're talking eight billion and rising Internet of Things devices that are connected and interconnected. And it's everything from your coffee pot to your refrigerator to different appliances around the house. And even your car. Your car your home security system, your baby monitor, the Nest system that operates in your house that, that controls uh, HVAC. So, you know, as a result, we are exposed. And so many of those devices uh, operate with manufacturer default passwords. And there is malware, Murai was the most famous one that was floating through the internet that managed to recruit some several hundred thousand devices into a botnet that began attacking websites and taking them down one by one. You remember Spotify and CNN. What's a botnet? Uh, a botnet is, uh, think of it as an army of robotic uh, electronic devices that have been recruited. It's like a zombie army. And they are directed to do spam, to attack websites as fake traffic. So and that's a denial of service. Kind that of is attack. a denial of service. So it would, your air conditioner would shut down in your example if a, a botnet attack. Well, if a botnet attack, you could, you, people would attempt to get onto a website and be unable to get there because the website was being overwhelmed. Think of it as, as facing a hostile army and being overwhelmed by this army. Uh, so, you know, botnets are problematic for sure. and. This is the way you can paralyze a website or more. For example, Ben Gurion did, uh, University did a study where they said you could string together uh, 2,000 cellular devices and bring down uh, a, uh, or 6,000, 6,000 cellular devices, and you could bring down a state 911 system. And if you strung together 200,000 devices, you could bring down the emergency network for an entire nation. Uh, so that's somewhat daunting. 
very potent weapon. Yeah. And we might not even know who did it. Absolutely. Now, uh, getting back to uh, Vault 7, I mean, what Vault 7 exposed were various tools that the CIA used to uh, infiltrate uh, Microsoft Windows uh, software and uh, so that they could um, have access to cars and iPhones and, and other devices uh, using Microsoft uh, software. Yes, they uh, call Possibly it even accomplish assassinations by uh, uh, causing the crash of a car. Well, you know, and, and again, there was, what do they call the mother of all Microsoft attacks, that, that sitting out there, at least that had the capacity to occur. And, uh, the, you know, what gets people extremely upset about CIA or NSA is they compile the vulnerabilities, generally zero-day vulnerabilities. That's one where you have, there's no way to stop it because no one's ever seen anything like it before. So they compile these vulnerabilities and they sit and they wait and they look and they see if anyone is, is attempting to do something or they've given themselves the opportunity to do something if and when they want to do something with a foreign actor. And people are very disturbed about it because they say you should be notifying the company whenever you find a vulnerability because one of the most important things any organization can do is discover a vulnerability, however, and then move to patch that vulnerability as quickly as possible in order to protect everyone that uses that software or that service. Protect their customers. Correct. Uh, so, but the CIA, NSA, law enforcement, they like to see vulnerabilities because that's how they get information. That's correct. That's and how they get in. And uh, there was a commission that the uh, President Obama set up that would actually evaluate these vulnerabilities and make a decision as to which ones should be reported to companies and the timeline within which it should be reported. Now, uh, what about the NSA hack? There the leaker was uh, an organization called Shadow Brokers, which had some Russian fingerprints on it. Surprise. Uh, what a, surprise. <laughs> so what do we know about that? Well, you know, again, all we know about the NSA is that, that again, they found vulnerabilities and there were tools and there were uh, ways that they could get in. This was, I guess, more of the Microsoft situation, that they could get in and, and, and wreak havoc. And someone said, we're one to get their hands on these tools, and now they're out there, uh, that one could attack Microsoft and crawl into Microsoft-related uh, systems and sit and wait and put malware on people's computers and, uh, and create a real problem. Or even uh, Cisco or uh, uh, the switches and, uh, and yeah. get into there. Now, uh, I mean, I can't think this, this really puts into sharp focus the fact that uh, we are under continual assault, that breaches have become the third certainty in life, and that when we talk about war now, the cyber war has replaced the Cold War. And we are all vulnerable. The government, business, consumers, media, all of us. Let's uh, talk a little more about the tension between law enforcement and um, Apple or Microsoft. You remember in the San Bernardino attack, uh, mm -hmm. the FBI recovered uh, the smartphone of uh, one of the shooters and then attempted to access the smartphone, which was password protected, uh, right. so to get access to the data that was there, who the terrorists had called and who had contact with, and that would be very important intelligence information. And Apple refused to cooperate in uh, getting the FBI into the smartphone. Uh, apparently, if you uh, try the wrong password five times or six times, the whole thing shuts down. Yes. And you'd lose all the data. Correct. Eventually, so there was a lawsuit. Uh, now, how should that lawsuit have played out? Well, I happen to have supported Apple in all of that. And, I, you know, I'm a big encryption fan. I think the reason why we're in the mess we're in is because there has been insufficient use of encryption. Now, it's getting better, but we're not completely there yet. Apple has been well known for encryption. Of course, an Israeli firm figured out a way ultimately to get into that phone. That's why the FBI moved away from pressing Apple. But also, some people felt that the FBI was really trying to set precedent here because there's case after case after case where they were going to different courts around the country, murder cases, drug cases, espionage cases, where they were looking for ways in to Apple phones. And of course, remember that uh, a company survives based on the trust of its customers. Apple was not only concerned about what was going on in the U.S., 
but there are a lot of countries all over the world that would say, well, if the FBI can get you to do that in the U.S., then you should do it for us in our country. And if you don't do it, we'll just get rid of you and use somebody else. So you don't believe uh, Apple should be required to put a back door on all its smartphones so that law enforcement can get in, assuming they have a warrant? No, I don't think so. And I'm a, listen, I'm a, I came out of law enforcement. I, I am a fan of law enforcement. But what disturbs me is any time you create a back door into any encryption system, you are creating a vulnerability. And if law enforcement can see it, so can the bad guys. And then they will exploit it for their purposes, and then we're back to square one again. Well, I mean, but uh, analogize it to uh, bank records. Uh, my bank has a lot of personal data about me, including my bank balance and uh, my deposit and withdrawal history. Sure. And now that's all confidential. You can't call my bank and ask them for that and get it. But law enforcement could subpoena they it. They could subpoena it, correct. And uh, so that's accessible to them. Why, why is uh, what's on my iPhone any different? Well, I think Apple was also taking the position that if someone had said, let's sit down and have a debate, a national policy debate, and let Congress make a decision and let Congress pass a law. But the FBI was using as the basis of its uh, attempts to get into the iPhone, the All Ritz Act, which was 227 years old. Clearly, the founders didn't have any particular concept of the digital world we live in today. And I think that was part of Apple's consternation in the whole thing is Tim Kick didn't want to read about it in the newspaper or get served with a document about it. He felt it's something that we should sat down and talk about. Where do we uh, go from here? I mean, uh, Facebook recently brought an action in New York uh, brought it through the New York courts because they were trying to resist a search warrant. Correct. And they lost. They did. Now, they lost perhaps on technical grounds, but uh, they still claimed that there was a value of privacy that was constitutionally protected. Now, do you agree with their position uh, that law enforcement couldn't use a search warrant to get Facebook data? I do. I, you know, I'm, I'm very At least concerned. from the third party. Because there's so much information out there about us and information that we didn't even know is out there about us that uh, we just have to be very careful with the way we we operate. Well, should we practice internet abstinence and stay off the internet entirely? That's not going to happen. Not going to happen. We're, we, that, that ship has sailed. That toothpaste is out of the tube at this point. So uh, you're on the internet. You're on Facebook. You're on Twitter. Yeah. Um, and uh, how careful are you with your data? Very careful, because I try absolutely not to use very much personal data. It's more about when I write something, I post it. But I am worried about people, and my wife included, who have a tendency to put pictures in there about everything and everyone at every moment. And there's an awful lot of information that people can glean, stalkers, kidnappers, uh, and uh, burglars, and it is of great concern. Well, so, you remember the case of John Sowers, who uh, was uh, the British ambassador to the United Nations, and then he got promoted uh, to head of MI6. Right. And his wife had put on Facebook all sorts of pictures of their family and their uh, home by the sea and whatnot, which may have compromised their security. He got the appointment anyway, uh, but it's you can see how dangerous it is because... Uh, Hostels could get access to that information and perhaps blackmail him and, uh, uh, or perhaps uh, threaten his family in some way. Well, what's of great concern is that we're living in a world now where people have a tendency to fling every possible morsel about their lives into cyberspace. They put everything on social networking and they often don't realize that a lot of the information that's posted on socially accessible sites is information that will find its way into the answers to security questions. When they set up their security protocols, what's your mother's maiden name, what's your father's father's middle name, what street did you grow up on, what was your pet's name, what's your favorite band, your favorite color, this is the kind of information that people post. And unfortunately, a very clever identity thief or scammer can be sitting looking at different information on different websites, gather that information together, and ultimately use them to brute force his or her way into the website of that particular Oh, well, individual. that's the forgot password technique, where uh, when I um, uh, 
log into a site and uh, they ask me a number of security questions in case I forget my password. Correct. Now, a lot of those questions are uh, questions the true answer to which uh, may be found uh, elsewhere on Facebook or Twitter or somewhere else. Instagram. Where did I go to school? Or right. Where did, uh, uh, you know, what was my uh, uh, best friend in, uh, in high school or something of that sort. Now, you have uh, some advice for answering those security questions. What's that? One word. Lie. 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 You're telling people to lie. Lie. So uh, It's perfectly so, acceptable to lie on social networking when it comes to security questions. So when they say, where'd you go to high school? I say, say Adam, Sky High? Adam, Adam Levin High School. Adam Levin High School. Say and, Jim Zyron High School. So you I'm, know? I'm the only one who knows. That's right. And The key thing is don't use something that somebody who knows you would know you know. Because, unfortunately, an enormous percentage of identity theft occurs within the family and friend unit. But they do not conduct an OPM background investigation as if you were getting a security clearance when you give an answer to a question setting up a security protocol. You'll also see those questions possibly pop up as part of two-factor authentication. When you start to log on to a website, it says unfamiliar device detected. It then will do one of two things. Send a code to your smartphone or give security questions. Where you have the option, do a code to your smartphone. Oh, that works. It's better yeah. as long as you have your smartphone. Right. If you don't have your smartphone, if it's been stolen, it becomes problematic. But the great thing about two-factor authentication is if someone is able to discover your passwords. And there have been a lot of website breaches where passwords have been discovered. So it's not a question of whether they were long or strong. It was a question that they were discovered. So if a password or a, a, a login uh, credential is discovered, then the best thing to do is two-factor two authentication because they can start the logon process, but they can't finish it because they can't get access to the code without your smartphone. Now, uh, let's take General Petraeus. Uh, mm -hmm. General Petraeus uh, communicated with his girlfriend uh, by giving email messages on Gmail uh, and um, creating them in a draft folder. And then she had access to the password in the draft folder. Right. So it wouldn't be found anywhere else. So that was a very clumsy way of doing it, wasn't it? There's not much protection. Well, first of all, you know, I don't care how secure they tell you you are email system is, you have to assume that anything that you put in an email one day is going to end up as the equivalent of skywriting. So therefore, you have to be really careful with what you put it. Pick up the phone, make a phone call. Uh, and if you have a problem about the phone number you're dialing, get a burner phone. But for heaven's sake, don't put things in emails. Be careful about what you put in text. It'll be in the Washington Post the it, next morning. The Washington Post, The Hill, The New York Times, The Wall Street Journal. Who knows? But it'll certainly show up somewhere. Now, who is most likely to fall for uh, Internet scams of various kinds or for identity theft? Do we have any data on that? Is it millennials? Is well, it they, they, Gen X? Is it baby boomers? Well, some say millennials, but the truth is senior citizens fall for it. Um, anybody can fall for it. I mean, I've seen people who, in the middle of a trading day on Wall Street, get a phone call. They think it's from the Internal Revenue Service. They're asked for pieces of information. They're not really thinking clearly because they're in the middle of six other things, and they give away the information. That happened to me in the country. I had a, a, a message on my uh, voicemail. This is the IRS, and we're about to file six judgments against you. Please call us immediately uh, if you want to avoid uh, having judgments, penalties, and fines. And I didn't call back because I knew the IOS, IRS doesn't operate that way. Correct. And, uh, so that's been the common scam recently, hasn't it? No, IRS scams, jury commission scams, all sorts of bank scams. You'll get a call from a bank. They'll say, Jim, is this your credit card number? Where you go, why, yes, it is. And they go, is this your expiration date? Yes, it is. Well, we just need to confirm that you're you. Could you please flip over your card and give us the security code? Right. You'd be surprised how many people do that. And then we've seen cases where they go, well, just so you know, you are a victim of some form of identity theft. So in order for us to start the process, please give us your social security number. Now they have your card and they have your life. Well, of course, if I uh, go to a restaurant and give them a credit card, uh, the waiter could go in the back room and quickly write down the credit card number and the expiration date and the security code. Absolutely. Front and back. 
So, That's why you have to remember that, you know, you are exposed. That's why one of the ways to deal with that is either check your accounts daily or sign up for what's called transactional monitoring alerts, which means you're notified on a, on as it occurs basis activity that's going on in your bank and credit card accounts. Best way to know what's going on. Now, uh, I have a question for you. Yes, sir. Adam Levin, uh, you and your firm have offered advice as to... Uh, what consumers uh, can do to protect themselves. Uh, do you ever put any, it made me very worried, do you ever put sensitive information in an email? No, ever. Never, never, never. Never, never, never. Don't do it. That's just been wonderful. Thank you so much, Adam Levin, for coming by. Thank you for please, inviting me. Please have some more tips on how to protect us. And thank you for coming by. Tune in next week for more Conversations in the Digital Age. I'm Jim Zirin. Take care and all the best.